1,800 years ago in the second century AD, Rome was the largest, grandest, and most powerful city on earth, ruling an empire which covered much of the known world. Roman legions returned in triumph from conquests in Germany, Gaul, and Africa, bringing treasure from the conquered provinces and captive warriors for the slave market. At least a third of the million people who lived in Rome at this time were slaves. The emperor ruled supreme, his power almost unlimited. The Senate made the laws and elected magistrates, but had little real authority. This is the time, this is the setting of a tale, not of empire, but of Claudius, a boy of Rome. begins early in the day in Rome, just before dawn. Perhaps too early for some of my pupils, but the fresh air awakens them quickly. We often hold class outside, overlooking the forum. It is pleasant here, though there are distractions, like the chariots on their way to the Circus Maximus for the races. All of my pupils are from wealthy families, with the exception of Vistus, a slave from the household of Claudius. He has shown signs of unusual intelligence and is therefore permitted to attend school. The children learn the use of the stylus, how to form the letters clearly on wax tablets which can be used over and over again. Ink and papyrus, reserved for scrolls and books, are much too expensive for everyday use. Most books are written in Greek, which, next to Latin, is the most important language in the empire. I am Callisthenes, a Greek slave. Many teachers are Greek slaves, for learning leans heavily on the much older culture and civilization of Greece. When the children complain and ask why they must learn Greek, a foreign tongue, I tell them not for the language alone, but for the wisdom and ideals of the Greek philosophers and poets we study. Claudius wears a bulla around his neck, a medallion of pure gold, treasured in his family for generations and envied by all. It is his proudest possession. The bulla stands for courage, for loyalty, and obedience. It is worn always to remind a Roman boy that these are virtues he must learn and live by if he is to become a man, a good man, a noble man. I try to teach the meaning of such things as courage, loyalty, and obedience, how to wear the bulla proudly. But I think perhaps these are things only the gods can teach and a boy must learn for himself. Alexis, father of Vistus, sees the boy's home. First through the city, and then along the road that leads north to the estate of Claudius' father, a short distance outside of Rome. Many miles further, the road crosses the mountains to Gaul, the homeland of Alexis, who dreams of following this road to its end one day. Life is not unbearable as a slave, at least not working for the family of Claudius, but it is degrading. Slaves are not Roman citizens. They have no rights and are often forced to serve cruel masters. To watch Claudius and Vistus it is difficult to tell who is the slave and who the master. They are always together, as close it seems as brothers. 
They both dream of one day leading armies into battle. Though only for Claudius can this be true, for slaves do not lead Roman legions. The estate of Claudius's father covers several hundred acres. Small farms are few because there is little profit in farming. Grain is obtained cheaply in the provinces to feed the people of Rome. The great estates raise only enough for their own needs and turn most of the land into orchards, vineyards, and olive groves. The harvest will put fruit on the table and wine in the cups. Claudius's mother supervises the cooking for the family's one main meal, which is eaten late in the afternoon. The cooking is done by the household slaves. They cook in olive oil and add spices from far off lands, from Egypt and the Near East. In good weather, the main meal is often eaten outside in the peristyle or walled garden. The father is greeted most respectfully he is the head of the family, and his word or judgment is never questioned. It is the custom of aristocratic Romans to eat reclined on couches. Finger bowls are served before the meal, since spoons and knives are the only table utensils used, and most food is eaten by hand. The guests are often merchants, whose caravans cross the sands of Africa, whose fleets return to Rome heavy with goods. Business associates of Claudius's father, whose wealth comes from trade with foreign lands. In the evening, the children play games, perhaps, like checkers, or throw chestnuts into a narrow-necked vase. The house is locked and secured for the night, shortly after sunset. With flickering oil lamps the only means of light, the family usually retires early. When he was given the bulla, Claudius promised to wear it as long as he could live by it. At night, a Roman boy asks himself, have I lived this day with courage, with loyalty, in obedience. Claudius. Good wish. Libertatem rogavit pater meus. E pauki ser we never on to her. Putat patrum tuum da tuum esser. Sed cur. Ut domum ride amus. Num putas abira. A beer is too? Non care too soon. But problems, even the most serious, can be quickly forgotten. Wilsters! 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 <laughs>
Si non suscitator sanguinimitum. <gasps> A portet. As punishment for his disobedience, Claudius was forbidden to attend the races at the Circus Maximus. But it did not seem important. Nothing seemed important now. He would listen to his sister practicing on the lyre, or sit with the women as they worked at their sewing and weaving. One concern was Vistus, that the friend he had hurt might be well again. The world went on as usual, but something was missing from it. In class, there was oratory to practice. The ability to speak well and persuade logically is important for young Roman noblemen who will one day be the leaders of the empire. But Claudius had little heart in oratory. The temple of Jupiter, dedicated to the most powerful of all the gods, stands high over the forum. Here Claudius prayed and made offerings that his friend would be well again, that he might be forgiven for his disobedience for the great harm he had caused. The gods must smile on this boy, for Vistus recovered quickly, cared for, waited on hand and foot by the one who was his master. In a few short weeks, things were as they had been before. At least for a time they were. Claudius. Quid? Quid for telling with Tunk. Where are you that? Pater Libertatum Rogawit. That data is. The skating was cross money. Libertatum? Omnium nostrum. Mene de tour Rogawit. Rogawit Patrum. And me Rogawit, not me and Patrum. Me he has to. Ego dis mota abtuli pro vita tua, posidio te! Sometimes it seems that life and the gods do not deal fairly. But it is at such times that one may learn the meaning of courage, of loyalty and obedience, keep the promise of the bulla and become a man, or fail, and remain a boy. It is a time which comes to all. The slave Alexis with his family departs for Gaul this day. But Alexis is no longer a slave and his son will grow as a free man. It is good. It is a time of happiness and of sadness. Wallet 
Augustus. Voila, Claudius. Thus ends the tale of Claudius the boy and begins the tale of Claudius the man.